Well, hey, uh, today we're going to talk a little bit about uh, defenses to crimes, okay? So someone alleges that a defendant committed a crime, okay? So there's a few different things that uh, defendants can do, that a lawyer for a defendant can do, or the guy can represent himself, but you know what Lincoln said about that. So basically, uh, most of these defenses break down as either justifications or excuses, okay? And the main thing to get out of this is that uh, justifications are complete defenses. So a uh, simple one that you could say is justifiable homicide. That means somebody was killed, homicide, somebody's killed, but it doesn't mean that it was a crime. It doesn't mean that it was murder. It means it was justified by for example, self-defense, okay? Self-defense. Now, uh, excuses, on the other hand, would be ideas like, uh, let us say, one of the ones that come up every now and then uh, are uh, involuntary uh, intoxication. Somebody slips a mickey to somebody and they become violent, they hurt somebody, they didn't know it, uh, this type thing. Uh, other defenses we'll go into more later, but let's touch a little more on the justification side and uh, look at some other complete defenses. So one thing to keep in mind about any defense is always defendant, this is a sign for defendant, is innocent until proven guilty, okay? So the way the thing starts out, even though the guy's been arrested, even though the guy's been held in jail, even though the guy had to post bond, you know, post his dad's farm, whatever, he is still innocent until proven guilty, okay? The other thing, the prosecutor, or plaintiff, as this symbol shows, has to prove the case beyond a reasonable doubt, okay? So these are all important. So these are the basic elements of a case, and so uh, as we go down through these, we have to look at, <clears throat> you know, continue to maintain the attitude that the person's innocent until proven guilty, and that the prosecutor has to prove their case beyond a reasonable doubt. And just somebody saying, I think so, or uh, seems logical to me, or, you know, words like that, not good enough. It has to be uh, reliable evidence that, you know, is very provable. And some of the things we've seen in some of my other uh, videos about eyewitness testimony and lineups and things like that, show that there's been a lot of error and a lot of poor judgment that's been uh, used in selecting different witnesses and so forth and that their statements were not really that reliable. So uh, what is reliable? Things like DNA, physical evidence, that type thing. Uh, so those are important considerations too. Well another big one I want to consider is the one of alibi. This is the defense of alibi, okay? So what is an alibi? What it's saying is, uh, you know, that there's a robbery at the convenience store uh, at the corner of X and Y, okay? Okay, so what does it say? Well, uh, alibi would say uh, defendant was in another city physically impossible for him to commit that crime, okay? Uh, and there are people that were convicted on eyewitness testimony in spite of alibi testimony regarding 
uh, person not even being in that city. It's happened several times. Uh, sometimes it's right, sometimes it's wrong, because it's up to the jury to decide who they're going to believe. But the basic premise of a jury's job is to really believe everybody, assume everybody's telling the truth, uh, and then try to fit it all together. But the problem you get into sometimes is there's just no way that it's going to work like that. So, uh, you know, that's, that's another thing to think about. So alibi, uh, the one I like to use all the time is, uh, here's a picture of me with my friends at the ball game, at the Cubs game. Here's a picture, here's a ticket stub, okay? And uh, right on that picture is the date and the time. And it matches up with the ticket stub. And it's me with two of my friends, and my two friends are going to testify that yes, I was at the ball game, I wasn't even in town when this robbery happened. Okay, so that's alibi. Now, the problem with this though can be that uh, you have to give notice. Alibi would be considered what we call an affirmative defense. Generally speaking, the defendant has no duty to present any evidence, okay? They can just stand quietly, don't have to say a word, uh, and so basically, uh, you know, this is kind of an exception when you get into this. If you're going to make an averment that a person uh, has an alibi, then you have to give a list of witnesses uh, to the opposing attorney, which is the district attorney or the prosecutor. And this can get you into trouble if you're working in this area and you don't uh, give that alibi notice. It can actually cause a lot of problems for your client. So very compelling, important. Uh, there's deadline dates that you've got to get that stuff turned in and make sure that uh, the opposing party has discovery of your list of witnesses. Now another thing uh, that comes up what about addresses? Well, you know, I would say that it'd be smart to include an address, maybe even a phone number, okay? So uh, these are just things that different courts have different rules on this, uh, but if they have a rule that says you've got to provide the name and the address and the phone number, then you'd better get that ready and get that turned in. Uh, so basically, I've seen that come up a lot of times in alibi cases is somebody just flat forgot to turn over the witness list. Okay, so uh, we talked a little bit before about self-defense. We're going to touch on it again. Self-defense is defense of yourself. Uh, the old rule was you had to be backed in a corner, no exit. You had to fight your way out. Uh, or you could be defending someone else uh, in your family. Perfect example, case that I uh, was involved in kind of in a tangent uh, form uh, because I represent the children in this one case. But these uh, kids went back into this farmhouse because they had bailed hay for the farmer and they thought he had a bunch of money because he paid them all in cash so they just assumed he always had money laying around. And then they got in there was really no money so they started knocking the farmer around. They actually, they knocked him out cold because they couldn't find any money. Well, the money's in the bank, you know. After all, it's the uh, year's 2000 or 2000 whatever, you know. Uh, but anyway, they just wouldn't be convinced, so they, they hit him so hard that they knocked him out. So he's laying on a fork, so then they start knocking the wife around, scaring the kids, you know, doing all this kind of stuff. Well, the guy goes behind the door, he finally, he comes to, he wakes up, you know, shakes his head and grabs a little uh, uh, varmint gun out from behind the door, which is a 22 rifle, and just starts shooting at these uh, burglars that have broken into his home and terrorized his family, and he shoots all of them like four or five times. He doesn't kill any of them, but he wounds every one of them. He blows all the windows out of their car, they're trying to get away, they're going down the road in their car, and he's chasing after them and he's shooting them, shooting the car up. Uh, even the getaway driver uh, got wounded. And so the question then is, you know, was he guilty, was the farmer guilty of a crime? 
when he chased all these people out of his house. You know, his home was under attack. You know, think about that and let me know what you think in terms of a discussion board post or whatever, and then I'll share later what the outcome of the case was. But this is the kind of example of things like this that can come up. So uh, there is such a thing uh, as self-defense still. You can also be engaged in defense of another. Uh, there's a big issue right now. It's going to be in interesting to see on this Zimmerman case down in Florida how that's going to come out because they have this stand your ground law in Florida is a lot different than the case I described in Indiana. The case in Florida, the guy's out on the street. Well, you know, they both got the right to be out on the street. So what makes him think that he can stand his ground with this guy? And really, it's none of his business what the other guy's doing there. So what makes us think that, you know, the guy can attack another guy just because he doesn't like the way he looks or whatever, you know? Uh, so it is going to be interesting. There's been a lot of weird developments in that case. It'll be interesting to see how that comes out. The case that I talked about is a totally different because the guy was defending his family, defending his home. A lot different than just being out on the sidewalk or even being in a tavern somewhere where there's a back door. You could run out the back door. You could run away and so forth. So, um, you know, they've changed a lot of the rules. Used to be that if you could exit, you had to exit. Uh, which in that case would have been the old law uh, where the guy, instead of getting in a confrontation with somebody, instead of being able to stand your ground, you would have had to try to get away. Uh, so that's kind of a difference in the changes in the law over years. In the old days, let's say 100 years ago, if he didn't try to get away, then basically he would be guilty of some kind of a crime. So uh, this is uh, where we are on this. It's evolving, it's changing, this type thing. Well, another one that is very controversial is the insanity defense. Uh, and so uh, this is just a totally kind of out by itself type thing. It's, uh, you know, insanity defense. There's uh, two or three different approaches to it. Uh, the one is what we call NGRI or not guilty by reason of insanity, okay? And that's the primary one that people don't like. Uh, there's also a part to this, what we call the McNaughton Rule. McNaughton Rule. That's also very important. And that is uh, kind of the basis for what we call uh, inability to distinguish right from wrong. So it's right. If a guy can't tell the difference between right and wrong, then he's got a mental problem is the theory and he shouldn't be convicted of a crime. Instead, he should be subjected to some kind of medical care. Now, an important thing you need to understand is, generally speaking, nobody goes home if they win a case and they're found not guilty by reason of insanity. They usually have to go to a mental hospital. There's actually some cases, there's a case in Indiana called Tony Caritzas where the guy was found not guilty by reason of insanity because he held a gun to a uh, mortgage banker's neck or some kind of a banker and they put him in a mental hospital. He ended up sitting in the mental hospital a lot longer <clears throat> than he would have spent in prison if he'd have been convicted. So he's obviously uh, very upset about those developments over time. There is another possible <coughs> test that's used in some states that's the irresistible impulse test. Okay, and that's saying, you know, you may know something's right or wrong, but you just cannot resist uh, wanting to go ahead and do uh, the wrong thing. So basically, uh, irresistible impulse uh, and uh, as opposed to the McNaughton rule, a couple different tests that are used in this. Now, in addition to the not guilty by reason of insanity, there's a guilty but mentally ill. So they call that GBMI. Guilty but mentally ill. What that's saying is that although the person uh, is mentally ill, they still knew enough that what they were doing was wrong that they're actually guilty. 
Way too often, in my opinion, people are found guilty even though they are mentally ill. And I think it's kind of a bad situation. Now, very rarely uh, does anybody bring not guilty by reason of insanity. People have a mistaken understanding on this. A lot of people say, well, every defendant that goes into court is always wanting to say they're not guilty by reason of insanity. The actual truth is it's like 2% of all criminal cases that are processed does not guilty by reason of insanity ever even come up. And then, out of all those cases where they put on that defense, only about 1% of those people end up being found not guilty by reason of insanity. So, of all the people uh, that are put on trial, very few use this argument of insanity, and of them, very few are fortunate enough to succeed in that defense. So insanity defense, rarely used, rarely successful, and not as easy as it sounds. Well, one of the things that we uh, also want to talk a little bit about, many people have brought this up with me before, can intoxication be used as a defense in a criminal case? I was so drunk I didn't know that I was speeding when I hit that bus and killed all those people. Uh, and the answer is no, probably not, okay? But one thing is that if it's involuntary intoxication, then that's a little bit different, and you might have more success. But, you know, how do you prove that it was voluntary or involuntary? Uh, you know, you're going to end up calling witnesses. Is the jury going to believe them? You know, it's going to be tough. So I don't think anything with intoxication is going to give you absolute success. One thing I do want to say, though, is that in areas where there is a requirement for specific intent, like a murder, let's say, then just because someone's intoxicated, they kill a bunch of people on the highway, they're not going to be found guilty of murder. Most of the time, it's going to be like a reckless homicide, or an involuntary manslaughter or voluntary manslaughter, okay? One of those because it's just generally difficult to show that a person had the specific intent to hurt somebody or kill somebody when the only facts that you have in the case is the guy got drunk and killed some people out on the highway. It's just the way our system's set up. A lot of people say, well, this is terrible. But that's just the way it is. Now, uh, one thing I do want to point out, though, is that usually when we deal with uh, any kind of intoxication, uh, we're looking at it might be considered a mitigator. It is not a defense. It can be what we call a mitigator. Well, Mr. Daywalt, what is a mitigator? Well, a mitigator means it lessens the severity of the punishment, okay? That's the idea of what a mitigator is, okay? So, on we go as we as we talk about this more and more. Uh, same thing I want to bring up real quick is uh, entrapment. Now, we're down here. We've been talking about excuses for a while. We probably ought to change this so we don't want to get people mixed up. Now, entrapment. What is entrapment? We often hear about that. Entrapment. Now, okay, we have the police, and they decide, well, let's set up a pawn shop, okay? So the police are running this pawn shop. It's not a real pawn shop. They just put up a sign that says it's a pawn shop. They've got police working in there. Guys are coming in all day. Uh, they're saying, yeah, you know, you got anything to sell, uh, you know, we'll swap uh, your, uh, let's say, uh, VCR. <laughs> laughing. That happened in a case I had, but VCRs are so far out of the, you know, mainstream in the picture now that it's kind of a joke, actually. But anyway, let's say I'll give you $20 for that VCR because it's an antique or something. Because my first VCR cost me $1,000. I don't know if you know that or not. It's true. Well, anyway, 
Uh, so, you know, somebody wants this VCR because it's an antique, it's a Sony or whatever, 20 bucks. Well, uh, you know, they get along and they get they bring in all this different stuff and they start matching it up. The police are matching it up to reports of stolen property and burglaries, thefts, things like that. So the question becomes, you know, is this uh, a... You know, is this an entrapment situation? And so the, the courts have ruled almost totally is that the thought process for the crime has to come from the police, okay? It comes from outside, so in other words, external to the person. If the person has already stolen the property and they bring it into this fake pawn shop, then the police did not put the thought of stealing in the mind of the thief. This all came later when they bring it to the pawn shop to sell it. So if you see what I'm saying, the idea is the guy has to be a law-abiding citizen, no intention to commit any crimes, and then the police suggest the idea of committing a crime to the person. Had no idea or thought of committing a crime. The entrapment is uh, you know, it's a slow day, let's try to talk somebody into uh, committing some drug deals and then we'll arrest them for it. Actually, a case like that uh, in Indiana where uh, a guy was working for a confidential informant for uh, the police department and then the sheriff's department turned around and arrests him for doing uh, a drug deal. So, difficult to prove entrapment uh, if you do have an entrapment, it is a really graphic case of entrapment, okay? Uh, well, the one thing I want to talk about is this drinking intoxication a little bit. Use an example, case of Larry Mahoney. Uh, there was a bus crash May 14, 1988. Uh, Larry Mahoney was a drunk driver. He's driving the wrong way on the interstate. And he crashes into a church bus full of people, 64 people. Blood alcohol content, 24. Uh, and the legal limit at that time was 10. As you know, many of you now, it's 08 in most places. Uh, he had no memories, couldn't remember anything that happened. Now, he was initially charged with murder because he killed so many people. He killed 27 people. And so, eventually, he was convicted of uh, manslaughter uh, as opposed to murder. Uh, and so basically uh, he served a sentence uh, in this um, uh, particular case uh, and I'm trying to remember how much time he spent. Well, I think he was supposed to serve 16 years and then he actually served 10 years and 11 months because he got good time, he got uh, credit for a GED, and a few other things like that. Uh, he went to AA meetings, things like that. So he ended up serving 10 years. Well, there was quite a bit of outrage because he got out early in that particular case and they felt like that the sentence wasn't uh, sufficient you know, in the first place. So uh, basically, uh, he was a janitor while he was in the prison in Kentucky. Uh, and so he had good behavior. They said he was actually um, a model prisoner. So, you know, what do you do? That's the way the rules are set up. There's no way that you can convict this man of murder because there was a lack of specific intent. And so this is really a good illustration of that. So, hey, consider what I gave you. Uh, look at your book. Look at some other things. And then give me your thoughts a little later in the class. As always, if you need to reach me, robdaywalt at me.com